So the next thing we want to do is get back to the um, to the uh, session here that we were looking at before on uh, Sputnik. So do you want to turn the lights out and I'll start this up. Von Braun promises to get it done by the end of January. We were told whatever component you have on the bird, it better be the best you can do. So it was a mad scramble. People were taking parts off and putting new ones on and all kinds of things like that. So there was a lot of pressure to be sure that that bird was as uh, well as we could get it and ready for launch. At the same time, the Vanguard team is also under pressure, preparing to launch their satellite. They were working all night long. I'd leave at night and they were still working. I'd come in in the morning, they were still working. I learned a valuable lesson there. If you work people long hours, they'll make mistakes. Three, two, one, zero, ignition. Eight weeks after Sputnik 1, December 6, 1957, on live television, Vanguard rises a few feet, loses power, and explodes. I hate to say this, but I think we were happy to see it blow up because we knew that the only other chance that the United States had of getting anything into orbit in a reasonable point of time was our bird. By late January 1958, the Von Braun team is ready with Explorer. The rocket is the Jupiter C, a modified redstone with extra stages added. The upper stages are built by JPL, as is the satellite, which contains scientific instruments designed by James Van Allen of the University of Iowa. Shortly before midnight on January 31st, 1958, the Jupiter C lifts off, carrying the Explorer satellite. They waited for 90 minutes, and here's the signal coming over. It was, it had made it around and was coming back. Once we heard it was just jumping up and down, pop the, the corks time, and uh, uh, I, it's hard to describe the, the feeling. Four months after Sputnik, America has its own satellite in orbit. <laughs> Explorer will go on to do more science than either Sputnik 1 or 2 detecting bands of radiation surrounding the Earth, the Van Allen belts, named for James Van Allen. With Explorer, the U.S. has entered what comes to be known as the space race, a competition Dwight Eisenhower didn't believe in. He wanted spy satellites for national security, but was skeptical whether moving toward a manned space program would be worth the cost. There never has been one nickel asked for accelerating the program. Never has it been considered as a race. I think he just felt that it was most important to make sure that the United States embarked on a sensible, cost-effective program. He never believed in space spectaculars. He always thought it was important, you know, to move meticulously forward. But the public and the media saw things differently. Once the Soviet Union declared that its space success 
was an indication of the superiority of the communist way of life, the United States had little chance but to say, well, we can do it better. Now, Eisenhower resisted that pretty strongly, but he was fighting a losing battle. In 1958, Eisenhower creates a new civilian agency to run America's space program, NASA. Federal funding for American science and education is also increased to better compete with the Russians. In March 1958, Project Vanguard tries again. Vanguard becomes the second American satellite. Its data prove that the Earth is not perfectly round, but slightly pear-shaped. Today, Vanguard remains in space, the oldest artificial satellite still in orbit. The success of explorers cements Werner von Braun's image as an American hero, the man who put the U.S. back in the race. The U.S. government keeps secret the details of von Braun's World War II past, which only emerge after his death. Von Braun's greatest legacy is not the V-2 or Explorer. When Americans reach the moon in July 1969, ending the space race, it is a Von Braun rocket, the mighty Saturn V, that gets them there. Dwight Eisenhower's space legacy remains largely unknown. Just before he leaves office in 1961, the spy satellite he wanted, codenamed Corona, finally becomes reality. Corona begins a revolution in American intelligence gathering. The first batch of film, first 20 pounds of film back from Corona in 1960 have more information on them, that one first load of film, than all of the U-2 fights co combined. Just as Eisenhower hoped, reconnaissance satellites proved to be a bonanza, not only for him, but for every president who follows. What he hands off to the presidents that come after him is an amazing amount of information. We know when we go to arms limitation talks, salt talks, uh, all the sort of talks we would go to with the Russians face to face, we know exactly where everything was because of these satellites and they, they become our, our trump card. For the rest of his life, Dwight Eisenhower never discloses his role in creating one of America's most valuable intelligence tools. If you read Eisenhower's memoirs, the Corona satellite program and the other intelligence satellite programs he had approved, all these he took to the grave. He and his advisors didn't say a word. The popular understanding of Eisenhower in the late 50s was he was this nice old grandfather who played golf, and other people were running the administration. And of course, we now know, in fact, that he was very much in command of what was going on behind the scenes. He was paying very close attention to secret intelligence, but that he preferred to keep his hand in this rather hidden. For people born after Sputnik, its legacy is technology. Now to the weather. If you have any satellite weather forecasts, cell phones, GPS, and personal computers. But for those who lived through the fall of 1957, Sputnik will always have a deeper, more profound meaning. For the first time ever, we leave this planet, we go into Earth orbit with a human-made object, and that signals the beginning of a new era, a new age, which we call the Space Age. And the world has fundamentally changed in the 50 years since that took place. I was in college at that time, and outside my dorm one evening at sunset, and I looked at that in awe thinking that man made this.
Sputnik 1 changed everything, it just changed everything. Okay, you want to turn the lights on? So, this was, a, this was really an interesting time in the fact that uh, um, the government and later on when um, Kennedy made the comment about we're going to go to the moon, then they really put a lot of effort into education, technology, and so on. It was a very, very exciting time. And a lot of things were produced in a period of time that's just inconceivable to produce them in that period of time now. Even during World War II, um, have you ever seen how many airplanes they produced in World War II? And you think, oh my, that was a 10 or 15 year period. And it really wasn't. It was about a three or four year period. They produced thousands and thousands of airplanes. But what they did is they took all of the resources that the government did and took control of these resources. So some things that you thought should be ordinary consumer products you couldn't find anymore. There was gasoline rationed and, and uh, lots of people went to, to work in the, uh, the factories and so on. But kind of one of the sad things, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later, is what happened after the space race? What happened after we went to the moon? How many, how many more missions did we have after the first mission where we landed on the moon? Does anybody remember? Two or three, Two or three of them, right? And there was one in particular that was pretty spectacular. Do you remember what that one was? Pardon? Well, Apollo 11, I think, is the one that landed, wasn't it? Apollo 13. What happened with Apollo 13? Yeah, they never landed, right? They had a, uh, in the um, uh, command module, they had an explosion of a, um, uh, one of the power systems, and they, they did not have enough power then to complete their mission, so landing on the moon. So what they did is they just replanted instead of, instead of trying to land on the moon, they just did a swing by by the moon and then back to the Earth. Was there any problem with resources supporting these astronauts on their return trip? Yeah, it was pretty hairy, wasn't it? They were losing, they didn't have filters for uh, getting the right kind of oxygen. There were different kind of adapters for filters in one module and another. What, are the, what were the modules that were part of that, that mission? Can anybody tell me how, how that mission was, what the architecture on the mission was? Well, f first they took off with the moon, moon lander, right? Um, so what they did is they had to turn the, the uh, lander around and, uh, and connect on to the command module. And what the command module was, was this module that stayed in orbit around the moon while the lander went down, right? And then after the lander went down, when it actually left, it left part of the lander on the moon, right? And this module that the astronauts were come in, come up and docked with the, with the command module, and got in the command module. Then they kicked this module off, and then they had the command module to come back on because it had the propulsion and everything else. So, but the one sad thing about it is after the, uh, uh, I think there was at least a couple of more missions after that. The whole mood of the country changed. They said, why are we spending all of this money in space and doing all of these things when there are lots of needs for funding in the, uh, uh, you, know, in, you know, poverty and all sorts of problems. And the, before that happened, people that were involved in that uh, thing, the, the engineers and the families of the engineers were all like heroes. But after that, the whole nation kind of turned against people. And I've read stories about where some of the astronauts and some of the people that, that worked on a lot of the things for NASA, they actually was a rise of ridicule within the communities. And uh, the uh, children of the engineers 
uh, and the astronauts that were heroes before were really looked down on. They were teased, and, and it was just the opposite situation. But now I think we're kind of coming around that a little bit. I think we're starting from this low of being bad people to starting to come up. And, and one of the things that you have to convince the general public with is what are the benefits of space? And I think now is when we're going to see the benefits of space. I really think that the microgravity experiments and things like that are going to have a significant output. Plus the fact that, you know, we, I think part of it, if you're interested in space, you really get some good training. And it's not just for working in space. It's good for everything because what are the things that, that we hope you learn here besides the technical things? How about working in teams? Do you get that in other classes? A little bit. But here you really do. You really hate to, you really learn to hate your friends, you know, working in teams. It, it goes a cycle. I have to show you this, uh, this sheet about working on uh, space projects. You got this real elation at the very beginning. And then what happens is you work and it gets harder and you're working nights. You know, you go to the point where you, you really hate it. And in kind of the end, you come up again. And, and uh, I th I'm not sure I've told you, but one of the projects that I was working on, I told my wife, if I ever get involved in another one of these projects, gonna, you're going to have to get my head examined. Well, as soon as the spacecraft flew and it worked, it was, oh, man, when are we going to get on the next one? So it's your turn. I'm going to give you a little tour today, but first I'm going to give you a little presentation on uh, some of the realities of the world, and you might find it interesting as we discuss why we went to space. I'm going to play this as a backdrop. This is a very interesting little movie that a fellow made. He spent about 400 grand of his own money to make, and it's called Sputnik Mania, and it's a little different from the one Bob showed you yesterday, or pardon me, on Tuesday. Because the one that you saw Tuesday showed people going back and looking at history through the filter of all the years and all the experience that happened in between. <coughs> but in this case, what this gentleman did was he went and got movies, videos, videotapes, newspapers, magazine articles from the day. And he used that to create this film so it's actually historically accurate. It's not filtered through people's remembrances and perceptions. And the title of my little talk is How NASA Saved the World. Okay, it sounds very dramatic, doesn't it? But in order to understand this, we have to know something about history. And I'm somewhat of a technical historian. I like history, particularly the history as it deals with things that happened in our past that form our present day. And I like technology, so I find that this all particularly interesting to me. You need to go back to World War II a little bit. People don't seem to know as much about the Cold War, but to understand where the Cold War came from, it came out of World War II. And it came out of the natural division of the world into two spheres of influence, one under the communist sphere of influence and one under the Western world sphere of influence. The Soviet Union was the wor a world superpower, and so was the United States at this time. And as a result of this, we had natural competition between these two spheres of influence. Each one had its own vision of how the world should be. And both of them were very competent, capable systems that produced a lot of good scientists. And enter another little factor, atomic weaponry. The end of World War II saw the first use of an atomic bomb in anger when we used it to end the war with the Japanese in the Pacific. This device enters the world landscape and changes forever how we look at things. Now we have within our capability to destroy large amounts of people very quickly at a distance, something that had never before existed. Enter into it the German missile program. Now we've set the stage. Now we have these two political systems that are vying for dominance of the world. And to quote a little thing to you from Lyndon Johnson, who became President of the United States after John F. Kennedy was assassinated, he said, in the eyes of the world, First in space means first, period. Second in space is second in everything. And as we know, on October 7, 1957, the Soviet Union successfully launched the world's first Earth-orbiting satellite. Everyone was totally shocked. All right? 
It was, it, it was a mind-blowing thing all around the world. All at once, people knew that there was something above their heads orbiting, passing over their countries that they had no control over. That some other country controlled outer space. Now, it might seem an exaggeration to you or a little overly dramatic, but it wasn't. It wasn't. And not long after that, in November, they launched Sputnik 2, November 7th, a much larger, more capable satellite. Something that we often overlook is what these satellites meant to the military people of the Earth. Sputnik 1 had a weight of around 190 pounds. Sputnik <coughs> 2 was about a ton and a half and could carry a payload of around 1,500 pounds. Well, what's that mean, you say? What do I care? Well, it just so happens that the smallest atomic bomb that could be built at the time weighed about 190 pounds. And the smallest hydrogen bomb that we built at the time weighed about 1,500 pounds. What the Soviet Union had done by launching these scientific satellites was to demonstrate to us that they had the capability to orbit atomic and hydrogen weapons over our heads. And that Johnson went on to say, soon the Russians will be dropping bombs on us from space like kids dropping rocks on cars from overpasses. Everyone was scared to death. Not because the Soviets had done anything, but because now this capability existed for which there was no countermeasure. There was nothing anybody could do about it. You couldn't reach up there in space and pluck these things out of the sky. So it meant that if someone wished to do this, they could. Well, this brought the space race on. Things were on from that point in the time. And what many folks don't realize is from the period of the fall of 1957, to the summer of 1958, tensions in this country and across the world reached fever pitch. That's when all the bomb shelters were built. Our government told our civilians in our country, if you can afford it, build a bomb shelter in your backyard. There may be an atomic war and we can't stop it. Our military people pushed to be the first ones to strike. They said, we need to put a stop to this right now. We need to hit them and hit them hard. We need to go to nuclear war right now, because if we don't, they'll increase their capabilities, and soon we won't be able to do anything about this. Well, on the other side, their people are smart too, and they say, the Americans are getting all excited. Maybe we better think about hitting them first. So tensions ratcheted up little by little until we were literally teetering at the brink of nuclear war. And in fact, Khrushchev came to Camp David, I believe in the summer of 1958. And he and Eisenhower had a discussion about these issues. And one of the things that uh, Khrushchev said was, President Eisenhower, I'm having a problem. My generals want, want bigger and bigger toys, and uh, they want to put them to use. And he, Eisenhower said, so do I. We have the same problem here. Maybe we should not listen to our generals and just figure everything out on our own. So one of our first successful satellite launches was Project SCORE. Do you discuss that one? Here we see the exact films from the time. This is an interesting little movie, and I would actually advocate that in the future you use this one instead. Okay. It's much better, because it gives you this flavor of what happens. And what happened after this? Almost anything could have happened, right? We could have gone to war. I mean, it could have been all over for us. But cooler heads prevailed. People thought this out, Eisenhower being one of them. And in secret, he decided to put a little message on the satellite. He went to his engineers and he said, I don't want you to tell anybody about what I want you to do, but I want you to build into this satellite a tape recorder. And I'm going to tape record a message on it to be broadcast to the world. And he broadcast from this satellite, and after it was launched, you know, they activated it under ground control and turned this recording on. And this message went as follows. It was around Christmas time of the year 1958. And he said, this is the President of the United States speaking through the marvels of scientific advance. My voice is coming to you from a satellite circling in outer space. Through this unique means, I convey to you and to all mankind America's wish for peace on earth and goodwill towards men everywhere. 
That was a 58-word message, but it had a unique effect on the world of calming people down. Now, you have to remember that up until this time, all of our satellite launch work had been done basically using military vehicles. Well, that sends a message to the world that these two superpowers are working on the militarization of space. And that would be bad, because orbiting weapons would make everything dangerous for everyone. So what happened was, Eisenhower said, you know, I'm going to take this civilian organization we have. I think it was the National Administration for Civilian Aviation, is what I believe it was, NACA. And I'm going to convert it into the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. And I'm going to put all future space developments in the hands of not the military, but of a civilian organization. This new thing I'm creating called NASA. And I'm going to let NASA take us into space rather than the Air Force or the Army or one of them. Because I want to change the perceptions of the world as to what we're going to use space for. We're going to use it for the peaceful advancement of science for all men. And in this manner, he diffused the space race. He changed it from being about orbiting weapons and the extinction of mankind on Earth into something that could be viewed as a positive advancement for all men in the conquest of outer space. And so that's why I call this how NASA saved the world. Because through that particular implementation, that creation of that agency, that change in direction, we sent a clear message to the world that at least one of the superpowers was not interested in the dominance of mankind from space. And this led the way for the Soviet Union to essentially change their perspective somewhat. And later, in the early 1960s, we signed treaties banning the militarization of space between both countries, saying that we would not orbit atomic weapons and that we would go in a peaceful direction. Okay? So this is an interesting thing to note. Oftentimes, we think about the space race and going to the moon as being purely about national prestige and uh, uh, issues of that sort. But that was not the case. That's not how it all started. It really all started out as a contest between two superpowers to demonstrate whose political system was the best. And in that case, the Russians beat us. And they showed the world that they had the technical ability to do this immense feat. And it gained them enormous prestige. And this was one of the impetus for President Kennedy to say, by the end of this decade, we'll place a man on the moon. We raised the bar to another notch there, and we said we would do this. The Russians were first in space, and they then had many firsts after that. They orbited the first human, Gagarin, he went around the Earth, and other things. But we got to the moon, and that more or less kind of brought an end to that chapter of the competition and began a chapter of coexistence and cooperation, one of the first space programs that was engaged in by the United States and the Soviet Union was the, uh, oh, what was it, 70, round 74, where we had the, yeah, had the docking. Apollo Soyuz docking yeah. mission. Right. And so that was a very big deal, that we would get together and work together in space, where we had been rivals before. That's all I had to tell you about. I hope you enjoyed that talk. I would advise, if you had the opportunity to see this film in its entirety, you'd find it very enjoyable. You get a view of what people thought at the time. In the backdrop of this, I'll just go on for a moment and say, you have to remember other things were happening. We just celebrated the 50th anniversary of Martin Luther King's speech, given on the mall, the I Have a Dream speech. To go back in time and look at that time was a period of unrest in the United States because civil rights had become a big issue. Things like the students trying to go to school in Arkansas, that happened in 1957. And so we have cases where the Soviet Union was able to point to the United States and say, ha, look, they say they are the bastion of freedom and democracy for all people, and yet these students simply want to go to school and they're being denied their rights to do so. In other words, the Russians had the ability, because of their Sputnik, to get the world stage, and once they had the world stage and they could talk to the world through the press, 
they were able to point out a lot of the flaws in our own system. We had a lot of things going on back then. We were doing precursors of the Vietnam War, so many other things going on that uh, people don't realize. As they think about Sputnik, they say, oh boy, big deal, Sputnik. No, it happened at a time, sort of like a critical juncture. A lot of things were going on <coughs> and were really tense. So, all right. I think another thing that maybe is a little bit of history here while we're into it is uh, what happened uh, during the uh, Vietnam War uh, this was a time from World War II where everybody in the United States was for this, and then we come along and, and uh, we had the Korean War. The Chinese came south into uh, Korea. These, this period of time is really unique in that so many things happened that shape our modern world today. In World War II, we had a clear-cut enemy. In fact, the United States and the Soviet Union were allies to defeat the forces of fascism, Hitler's Nazi Germany, and to bring that episode to a close. After that war, though, our differences in political systems caused a division between us. And in fact, Winston Churchill, I think, giving a speech in, uh, I believe it was University of Missouri, said, it is though an iron curtain has descended across Eastern Europe. We could not see what went on within the Soviet Union after that period of time. Its borders were closed to us. It was not possible for Westerners to easily travel there. And so we had no information about what happened within their country. Now let's fast forward to 1950. It turns out that a division of Korea led to the Korean War. The communist North Koreans decided that they would reunite South Korea with the North. And so began an episode which became the first United Nations War. And that was a strange war because it still hasn't ended. A truce has never been declared in that war. It's, never, it's not over today. The North and the South still exist as armed camps. And we support the South. The Vietnam War came along, and that's French Indochina. That was a strange war. We had no business being there. But what we saw was, and this movie makes the case for it, the Soviet Union was beginning to have successes in the world. They were beginning to demonstrate to people in oppressed countries why they should become communists. And so we were seeing nations around the world beginning to have communist leadings, and this worried the people in the West. They wanted to stop this. And so when they saw South Vietnam invaded by North Vietnam, the communist North Vietnam was invaded by South, invaded South Vietnam, we said, oh, oh my God, another one. We had to do something. So we got involved with trying to stop that. And we embroiled ourselves in one of these no-win situations that we've become very good at getting into. But it really changed the texture of how people looked at the United States' involvement in the world. We were heroes in World War II. We really didn't settle anything in Korea. And now we're involved in Vietnam in this thing that just you know, doesn't seem to have any point. A lot of Vietnamese people didn't even want us there, like so many times in the world we see today. So it's a unique <coughs> period of American history where we went from being on top of the world necessarily to not being on top of the world. We were really viewed as a second-rate scientific power after Sputnik. It had, it had an enormous impact. Here we were, the big victors of World War II, and now we're not. Now, now the Soviet Union has shown us their system is better than their, ours. Was that kind of where you wanted to go with yeah, that? Yeah, and I, I, one of the things that uh, during the Vietnam War, uh, it was really in vogue for university students to be against the war. And there were some tremendous, tremendous uh, uprising of students on university campuses. Military research ceased to exist on university campuses during the time of the Vietnam War. A lot of money was lost to universities. Before that time, the military would spend money for pure research into materials or different aspects of science or physics or biology or whatever because they had interest in these things you know in the long term but because people became so against the establishment against the war in vietnam against our involvement in other people's political decisions that the military had to withdraw i mean the cia used to actively recruit on college campuses the nsa DOD. They used to fund all sorts of programs and bring all kinds of money. That all stopped. In fact, 
colleges got so worried, they began moving their computer centers off campus. I went to the University of Pittsburgh in 1974. Our computer center was not on campus. It was located 15 miles away. It was linked by a microwave link. And that was because they didn't want students to occupy the building and set fire to computers. One of the kinds of things that people were doing in the 60s, okay, the, the weather underground and all the other unrest that came from this. And so we see how political events shaped the future of really our college campuses in this regard, how people react to this. There was a very extreme negative reaction. Now I have an interesting little thing to tell you. Has anyone in the room ever heard someone say that we really didn't go to the moon, that it was uh, all <laughs> done in a, raise your hands if you've heard that. Oh my gosh, really that many people, okay. Now as space science students, you may run into somebody someday who says that to you and I have an excellent argument for you to give them to disprove that concept to show why we did go to the moon. Now remember the story I just told you about the competition between the Soviet Union and the United States. Remember how Sputnik gave the Soviet Union the opportunity to embarrass the United States because we hadn't done something that they were able to do. Okay? Now don't you think that the Russians were watching our space program very carefully they have excellent scientists and engineers. They have wonderful optics, great telescopes. They have radars. They have everything we have in those regards. Maybe not, in some cases, high tech, but certainly capable. And they would have certainly watched the passage of a space capsule between the Earth and the moon. And they would have made sure that if we were claiming to go to the moon and beat them to the moon, they were going to make sure that we really didn't. That we did do it or we didn't. They were going to verify it. They were going to watch that thing. They were going to listen to the radio signals and the telemetry and all that stuff and record it. So you don't even have to enter into any other discussion with people than the fact that, don't you think the Russians would have called us liars if we wouldn't have done it? Because they sure could have checked it out. So in that aspect alone, you can quash those arguments. Because a reasonable person can't, can't dispute that. If we'd have given them the chance to call us liars, you bet they would. They said, oh no, they didn't go to the moon. We've been watching. There's nothing up there. There's no signals coming from the moon. So instead, this is the real, the real basis of being able to put that crank science to bed. Yes, sir? The NACA is National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Thank you very much. I couldn't find that on Google quickly because a billion things came up for NACA. Very good. Thank you for looking into that. And that became our modern NASA. It was a department that was converted over and greatly expanded and given this task of giving us ascendancy and then supremacy in space. And once again, under the direction of Eisenhower for peaceful uses. Okay. That's, that's super. Let me, let me add a couple of little things here. I was in San Francisco, got there in the early 60s, and... Oh wow. boy, you must have seen a lot of stuff. Going. <laughs> the Summer of Love in 1965. Yeah, yeah. and uh, there was Berkeley, uh, University of California, oh boy, Berkeley radicals was a hotbed oh of uh, rebellious students. They were dope rebellious. smoking, bra burning, draft card burning, <laughs> <laughs> raising hell, <coughs> long haired hippies. <laughs> And you still see some of them around. They're days. still there. They're right. Well, oh, now they're administrators. Yeah, they are. <laughs> they're they're doing what they hated before. But That's right. when I was there, uh, I had uh, been to Stanford and, and and finished my master's degree there and got out. But I lived very close. And what the students at uh, Stanford did is the buildings that had this secret research in. They broke into the buildings and started letting everything on fire. And the building that I was at when I taught at Stanford, they broke all of the glass out of the first floor. And some of the faculty have said that at that time, they went down there and stood in the lobby with guns if those guys come back. It was that kind of confrontation that was going on. And the, the students were interesting it wasn't just the Vietnam War once they got started they argued against everything and there was a park in Berkeley that the university owned the land and what they had done is um, uh, the people there had kind of made this into it's a vacant lot and they made it into this park for the kids and the university decided that they wanted to take the park over 
and do something that the university wanted, and it was a big set in, and it was almost a bloody war with those students. So that was a time when students were very dissatisfied. I remember uh, it was a time when the draft was on, and my oldest son, he says, well, if they, if they draft me, I'm going to Canada. I'm just not going to go into this war. It's just, you know, it, it was amazing, the fortitude of the students, and it, it, and it really was, it really took a lot of guts for some of them to do that, you know? There were the rebels in it. Uh, it was quite a, quite a time in history, and it's amazing how it's changed now that the, most of the students are, like yourselves, are hopefully more interested in getting an education, but, but you can have a tremendous influence on things, you know? If you see something that you don't like, I, I think you ought to have the guts to speak up. I think one of the things that has come down to us from that time, and you got to remember, we're old farts, Bob and I. We've been around a while. We've seen this stuff. And <laughs> you might say, well, so what? What's it mean to me in the current age, the current day? Well, I like to tell people, you don't know where we're going if you don't know where we've been. A little bit of history does you a lot of good. Now, the history is taught by most people. It can be dull and boring, but this sort of history is not. Because one of the things that came out of this period was the question everything had to. Don't just accept, don't just obey orders, don't just agree with the administration or the uh, organization or whatever you want to call it. All right, now that can go too far. The problem with a lot of these folks was they were unhappy with the current situation and they wanted to tear it down. Well, that's fine. But if you want to tear something down, you better have something to replace it with. And that's where they all fell down. They didn't have anything better to replace it with. And so it's important if you're going to change things, change for change's sake is not always good. You need to have something to replace the system you're tearing down with. And uh, it's funny, it made, it made a big impression on people who lived through this time. And it really began what I call, well, I'm going to get on one of my crank theories here, the dumbing down of America. Think about this. You have a lot of students who are really smart. They are the boom babies from World War II. They were born after World War II. The GIs that came back from World War II were different people than what went over there. The people who won World War II were a special breed. And, for example, one of the things that came out of World War II was the advancement in electronics. It didn't exist before that. After World War II, there was all kinds of electronics. And one of the smartest common men that came back from that war were radar technicians. Okay, radar was considered the epitome of electronics development, and the guys who were trained to do that work weren't geniuses, they were average guys who were turned into radar technicians, and so they come back to the United States. So all sorts of companies started after that time, all sorts of innovations came out of that time, and people had children, and they raised their children with this concept that it's going to be a new and better world, and, we're, and you're going to live better than I live, and your quality of life and your standard of living is going to be higher than what I had, and you're going to be smarter, and there's going to be more cool science available for you. Now fast forward to the mid-60s. These kids are now coming of college age, and they're going off to college, and they've been raised in the time of the space race. Remember what happened after the space race? started in 1957, they went into all the high schools in the land and they increased the amount of science and math that people were going to learn. Their ham radio clubs sprung up overnight and science clubs and rocket clubs. People got involved in what we're calling STEM today. Well, that was STEM back then. Boy, they were pushing it hard. And everybody was learning science and math and all this stuff. And so people were getting smarter and they were learning critical thinking, analytical thinking, uh, questioning things, questioning natural laws. Well, you move from that to questioning man's laws. And now we come to the time of, you know, this rebellious period where it started over the Vietnam War, but it didn't end there. It, it carried on. And so think now, if you're the government and you're observing the effect of how really well-educated children grow up to be questioning adults, and they're questioning the government, and they're making unrest. What do you think you should do about that for the future? Maybe make it so people don't get as smart. Maybe train people differently. And this is my conspiracy theory. This isn't anybody else's. But I look at this and I say, what happened to us? We were this nation before, and now we're sort of a different nation. And if you look in the period of the 70s and 80s and so on, engineering went way down the tube. Nobody wanted to be an engineer. Nobody wanted to go in science. Instead, they all wanted to become, you know, Wall Street brokers and make money by stealing it from other people. 
two ways to make money in the world. You create something and you generate wealth or you take existing wealth away from someone else. So the first one is good for everyone. It lifts the standard of living everyone. The second one, lawyers, lawsuits, shenanigans with uh, mortgages and brokerages, and this, that doesn't make money. It just shifts around who owns it. Unfortunately, we're in that phase now, it seems. We've gone away from the phase of the creation of wealth and the discovery and the building of things to this, well, you got a big pile. I'll take some of yours. If they take it all from the little people, that's the Well, it's easier. It's easier. Yeah. You can't take it from somebody who has a lot of wealth. They have lawyers that defend them. You've got to steal it from people who can't defend themselves. So that's us. But anyway, that's my idea of why the government wanted to dumb us down. If you look at a lot of the restrictive laws that were created, Gun Control Act of 1968 and so on, you'll find that a lot of things come directly out of this unrest. Geez, we didn't get time for a tour today, did we? We no, want to defer you're, that? You're on for Thursday. For next Thursday. Next Thursday. Okay, to do a tour. Okay, great. Well, I hope you enjoyed what I had to say today and found some of it educational, at least thought-provoking. Go home and think about this stuff.